Thank you, um, thank you to the organizers to begin for, for having me uh, and thanks to Sven for really setting the stage for my talk so that I, I don't have to um, explain too much about the site. Um, I'm, I'm really a geoarchaeologist and a micromorphologist and I think what I'd like to do today is illustrate how micromorphology can actually try to, to answer some of these questions. Um, and my talk will consist of two parts. Uh, the first one will be on how micromorphology can be used to improve um, and to maybe bypass this view of towns as monolithic entities by looking at different phases. So we'll do it in, on two levels. I'll, um, I'll illustrate each one with just one example uh, of how micromorphology can improve this. So the first will be on the temporal scale, the second one on the spatial scale. Um, and then the second large uh, part of my talk will be focusing on these uh, phases that already Sven and Petrian have talked about. Um, and I'd like to do this again by focusing on one example uh, for each of these phases and then just briefly mentioning uh, some of the others. And the case studies that I'd like to use are two from the Scandinavian area, so Hirbu and Kaupang. Uh, and then I'll focus mostly on two sites from the Low Countries, Antwerp and Tongere, and then maybe if we have time, um, I'll touch upon some stuff from Lier as well, because the, um, it can be compared quite well. Uh, so I like to use micromorphology, which is a geoarchaeological technique, and the big benefit here is that the stratigraphy, because the blocks are taken um, as a whole, the stratigraphy is preserved in the samples, so we can really see the contextual information um, and look at all the elements in their original place. Uh, and this is just how the samples are made. So we take them as a block sample from the profile. Uh, these are impregnated in a resin, made into thin sections, and then studied under a petrographic microscope, so using different types of light, uh, up to a magnification of about 1,000. So this is really a technique that helps us um, understand the microstratigraphy much better. Uh, and I've combined it uh, with a number of different methods I won't really come back to, but the results will be based on these as well. So microXRF, which is basically um, an X-ray method that maps the elemental composition of the samples. We can do this um, on the blocks of these samples, so you have again this relationship between different components. Um, we've also used the phytolith analysis in thin sections, so not in bulk samples, uh, done by Luc Freydags in Belgium. And I've also used particle site analysis, which can help us to, um, to see discontinuities um, in, in the texture, um, so maybe truncation changes. So if you look at the first uh, larger theme, um, I'd like to show you how we can improve the detail uh, of the phases on two levels. The first one is time. And if we look at uh, these early medieval towns, I think towns in general, in the archaeological records, um, the excavators are usually faced with two big problems uh, when it comes to stratigraphy. The first one is the complexity of microstratigraphy. So if you have very thinly laminated deposits, it's very difficult to, um, to relate the artifacts to these deposits, to relate uh, dating to these deposits, and to really see what was going on uh, in there. It's also very difficult to excavate these in a plane. Uh, so this is one place where micromorphology can really improve our image. And the second one um, are the result of complex formation processes and preservation, uh, as you can see in the second slide. So where we get, for example, thick homogeneous deposits, sometimes called dark earths, um, which were thought to be uh, maybe waste dumps or garden layers. But actually, if we look at these uh, with the microscope, we can see that we have actually a preserved microstratigraphy that can still be uh, seen and understood. So these are the two biggest problems that micromorphology can really help with. And my example here will be the one of Hildebu. And thank you to Sven for introducing this. Uh, we had two cores taken. So usually for micromorphology, we don't like to take cores because we like to be able to uh, correlate our information to the profiles and to the excavations. Hildebu was an exception because the site is so well known. Uh, and the cores were taken close to an excavation area, which you can see in white on the lowest slide and also the whole area has been mapped uh, using geophysics. So what we did was take two cores, uh, one 
from a non-dark geomagnetic, uh, geomagnetic anomaly and one from one of these dark geomagnetic anomalies that Sven talked about as possible workshops uh, and then compared them. Now for this part I'll just focus on the one that was outside the geomagnetic anomaly that was core 505 so this is just outside the main road and what we were able to do using morphology is really um, distinguish the different phases so what was going on and bypass this, this really monolithic uh, view of the site um, understanding it basically in the 9th century <coughs> where these wooden remains were really well preserved we can see the other things as well so I'll just run you through this uh, very briefly um, in the bottom part this is about um, one and a half meters so the bottom part was just a buried soil C horizon, B horizon a horizon um, and then actually in the A horizon we were able to see evidence, more evidence for cultivation um, and the growing of, of crops, so agriculture which uh, fits very well with the plow marks that were found. Um, and then what's really interesting is that we can see this phase on top of it, so before the town goes into its build phase we can see an intensification, um, what we like to call an amended A horizon which really just means that um, your soil is being trampled but there is a larger input of human um, waste uh, we have hazelnut shells, charcoal, bone material, suddenly there's much more going on and this is, um, well I'll get back to this later when I talk about the early phase but it's really interesting because we can see it, and this one is very hard to note um, in the field. Then we had the organic layers, um, which point to stabling, animal stabling, and on top of that, the settlement layers, uh, which we know uh, from the excavations as well. So these are layers, um, really thin layers of domestic waste and walking surfaces, the walking surfaces that could be um, house floors, uh, then covered by alluvium, but I'll get back to this. Now, what I try to do for my PhD, which is looking at all these different sites, is try to pinpoint these different phases. I've represented them here with icons, you don't have to look at all of them, but it's just a way to simplify um, the changes that are happening. Uh, and if you look at Hedebu, um, I by having two locations in our samples, that means we can already try to understand the space a little bit better. So if you compare these two cores, uh, the top one is from outside the geomagnetic anomaly, 502 is from inside it. We see that the beginning is actually really, really similar, and only in the upper, um, maybe upper 50 centimeter, um, there is a change going on. But I'll get back to this uh, later as well. Uh, now, what we can do even more than just look at two different locations is improve the detail um, on the site wide basis, and this is what was done in Kaupang. This is the joint research of what Karen Milek and Charlie French did uh, for the first Kaplan volume and then I continued looking at some of the other sites, uh, some of the other plots. So these uh, black and red and blue uh, lines are the transects where the micromorphological samples were taken um, and these were taken inside the houses, um, on a pathway, in a ditch and so forth. So we have different types of features that we could then compare micromorphologically. And the result of this was actually really exciting because in, if you look at the top right pictures, you, you can see how bioturbated and how badly preserved the site really was. Um, on the left is the plan that Sven has shown. Now, if we compare this with the micromorphological evidence, we see that it can really contribute quite a lot. So the phasing was really clear in the thin sections. We saw two different settlement phases. But also the plan could be improved by looking at the extent of the buildings. You could really see the difference between outside and inside, internal function, layout, um, where the hearths were located. And one of the interesting things is that uh, in, uh, under the microscope, uh, the pathway which was known from a footstep uh, on the left and a ditch which was known as well could be compared. And then we had this uh, question mark where we didn't know is it a pathway or a ditch. And that was clearly a pathway. So that's something the excavators didn't know. Uh, so the plans were much improved. Now if you want to look at the problematic phases in the archaeological record, I'll have to go fast. Um, the earliest phases, which uh, Sven already referred to, um, I've kind of grouped them as pre-town and beginning. Uh, and I also look at the youngest final phases, which is theme six in my thesis. Um, 
the earliest phases, I've kind of grouped pre-town and the intensification of activities because I think it's really difficult to, to pinpoint exactly when a town becomes a town for these early phases. So just uh, illustrating this with Antwerp, Dries will introduce the site later, I think, so I'll, I'll leave that for now. Here we saw um, a change from a dark earth, which is the lowest part of the fi uh, picture, where there was, again, crop cultivation going on, then a truncation, uh, so a removal of soil, um, then a, sh a short leveling layer, and then a stabling, uh, an animal stabling layer. Uh, we could see this uh, microscopically and with the elemental analysis as well, but I won't go into this. So here we see the first phase really as being a really intense um, animal stabling in both locations that were sampled. Now just going very quickly through the other sites, Tongere is a Roman town uh, where we were hoping to find early medieval uh, phases as well, but here we see in the beginning just a Roman house reparation layers, floors, buildings, uh, I'll get back to this in the latest phase. In Hedebu, interestingly, we had the cultivation, as I already said, no truncation of the soil, but really an intensification in the form of this amended A horizon. And this amended A horizon is really interesting because the layers look very much like uh, the ones we have from a later medieval marketplace in Lille, which is the first micromorphological study that took place there. I'm not saying that Hedebu was a market, but indeed, there was activity um, going on really close by and things were changing at a fast pace. And the interesting thing is that we have a hazelnut shell from the unimpregnated soil block. So we can actually still date this, C14 date this. And by correlating this, um, get the exact spot where, where this started. So this is a really good way um, to understand this better. Uh, and correlating this with the microstratigraphy again. In Kaupang, as Sven already said, uh, there were no traces microscopically for <coughs> pre-settlement cultivation. So this is the only kind of like pristine site that was uh, mentioned before. There is some limited soil development on the sandy soils, um, some truncation under the settlement phase. And what's interesting that Sven said was that these, um, these uh, well, there might have been seasonal occupation, but this was only seen in one single sample um, where there are a few... Uh, charcoal layers. So this is actually quite tentative and we would have to find more evidence to be really sure. Now moving to the late, uh, the youngest phases, the final ones, here you can see really one icon uh, overbearing all of these sites, which is truncation. This is a real problem because if it's gone, you can't really see it microscopically anyway. So what do we get for this phase? In Hedeby, as already said, the upper 100 centimeters are the interesting ones for this latest phase. Um, and in core 502, which was the geomagnetic anomaly, which may have been a workshop, what we really see is a pit with metal working waste. And here you can see the border in the, um, in the XRF picture, where the iron slag, metal slag is accumulating. It's really a very clear cut. And we also see some silver. Um, so it's a mixed metal working that took place there. Now this pit may have been um, an infill workshop as well, but this is what we see. Uh, and this is covered by about 50 centimeters of uh, what the excavators thought may have been a dark earth, or they weren't quite sure was what, what was going on there. And that was clearly uh, a colluvium with truncation taking place before that. Uh, in Antwerp, we had a problem of um, sampling because the, the interesting layers were already taken away by the archaeologists before we could get at them. So this, um, this is something that needs to be taken into the planning phase. Um, in Tongeren, there's a problem because the early medieval phase is really hard to see. It's all hidden in dark earths. Um, and here on this particular site, um, it was truncated by a medieval tithe hall. So actually in Tongeren, we haven't really been able to find this 6th to 10th century dark earth um, anywhere, or sample it anyway, for micromorphological research. It's only enough to sieve it because you don't see the um, contextual information. And in Kaupang, again, truncation um, agriculture um, has topped off actually only the second phase of, of settlement that we can see, so that's still quite early. Now, two slides to conclude. Um, what should we do? Because we see that these early medieval phases are hard to understand, but actually we can get at them micromorphologically. So how can we try to, to find these better? Um, and I try to, to make this type of flowchart that's really simple, but that kind of targets the right sample. So does your site contain in situ floors or recognizable feature? If it does, um, try to take transects, but also target special areas that illustrate the activities 
and not just the maintenance. So look at the corners, around the hearts, wall partitions, doorways. Um, if you have other features, try to sample them in the profile uh, if you can. If you don't have any features, if you have dark hearts, um, then we need to have a vertical sampling, ideally a full vertical sequence. If not, then we need a control sample from the parent material and then from every boundary, ideally, or from the distinctive features, microlaminated zones. And ideally, again, try to take two locations or three so you can get at the spatial differences here as well. Um, and I think the most important thing to take away here is that we should combine micromorphology with bulk sampling um, for other techniques, but really do this on the level of microstratigraphy so that these things can be correlated. Um, and actually, I think for that, micromorphology should, should be placed in an earlier stage, so really in the planning and assessment stage of, um, of the research, which is difficult because it's a method that takes a lot of, si of time. You need two or three months to prepare the samples. Um, but I think this is the only way to really uh, combine these multi-proxy uh, methods with a very detailed stratigraphical knowledge and dating. So to conclude, I think micromorphology have really offers a potential to move away from treating towns as these monolithic entities because we can understand a little bit better how they work both on a vertical um, or a, a time uh, frame and on a horizontal, a spatial organization frame. Um, and this really allows us to, to bring more nuance to the story um, and to detect differences and not just the similarities. And I think this is uh, the only thing that can allow us really to compare these towns uh, and challenge existing narratives on these towns if we have more information uh, to look at. And of course, there still exists a problem with these really interesting and not very well understood phases, so the earliest and latest ones. I think there's scope for, for discussion here as well. Is the stabling phase, is that a town already? Is this the intensification we're looking for? Do we need to have building settlements? What about the cultivation? So there are some interesting questions we need to ask here. Um, and of course, often these are absent from the, the archaeological record, so we need to find ways of locating these better and targeting them from the start um, in, multiple, in multiple locations so that we can really understand um, these phases better as well in the future. Thank you. Thank you.